Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the uh, McLean Center for Clinical and Medical Ethics, um, the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, and the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the fifth lecture in our 2016-17 lecture series on reproductive ethics. Um, brochures of the, for the series are available outside. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Stephen Brown. Dr. Brown is a pediatric radiologist at Boston Children's Hospital who specializes in prenatal and pediatric body imaging. Dr. Brown's work explores professional norms and ethical values that underlie clinical decision making and communication while using advanced diagnostic and therapeutic technologies. Dr. Brown's projects have included a national survey of prenatal care providers' attitudes about pregnancy management in the setting of various fetal and maternal conditions, and another study of the development of communication skills uh, for prenatal care providers and radiologists. Dr. Brown is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, completed a residency in diagnostic radiology at Massachusetts General Hospital, and fellowships in pediatrics radiology and pediatric interventional radiology at Boston Children's. Dr. Brown completed a fellowship in medical ethics at the Harvard Medical School. He's a long-standing member of the Boston Children's Hospital Ethics Advisory Committee, and also a faculty member in the Harvard Center for Bioethics and in the Office of Ethics at the Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Brown's talk today um, is entitled, as you can see behind me, Ethical Tensions Between Maternal Fetal Medicine and Pediatrics, Implications for Prenatal Counseling. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Stephen Brown. Thank you very much. It's, 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 it's really uh, great to be here. Uh, thank you, Julie and Dr. Siegler, for the invitation. And I just want to say how honored I am to be here uh, for many reasons, but uh, perhaps first and foremost is because of how much this particular center has informed my own thinking on the issues I'll be discussing. And hopefully over the course of the lecture, you'll, you'll, you'll see some of the intersections of our work. So I wanted to start just by saying that I have no financial disclosures to make, but I do want to say from the outset that I am white, I'm male, I'm Jewish, I'm between 40 and 60 years of age, I'm married, I live in the Northeast, I'm moderately liberal, but I'm politically unaligned. I, I work at a freestanding independent pediatric center and it's an academic process, practice, and as all of you very well know, all of these uh, factors may, uh, it, it may influence my interpretation of the facts as much potentially as any financial disclosures that I might have. So our understand, uh, the objectives for today are to discuss how obstetrics-based and pediatrics-based specialist attitudes towards pregnancy management and may reflect the interplay of clinical experiences and ethical values. And this is becoming of increasing importance as more uh, counseling and diagnoses, uh, uh, diagnostic uh, work uh, for, for, for pregnancies in which the fetus has uh, some congenital uh, diagnosis or prenatal diagnosis, more of that is going into the uh, uh, domain of pediatrics, whereas in, in previous years, 10 or 15 years ago, it was more exclusively the domain of obstetrics. And, but I want to place these differences, uh, and I'm going to place a lot of emphasis on putting these differences within the broader context of the portals for bias and practice variation that exist in prenatal counseling, because I don't think we can look at these professional orientation differences in isolation, but rather any policy implications ought to be considered within the broader context. And so what are, what kind of world is Crystal entering here? What, what are the portals to, to bias and practice variation that she's going to encounter? And I very much look forward to hearing what, uh, you, what you have to say uh, during, during the discussion uh, phase of this. But uh, let's start by saying, well, 
You know, the first thing is that she is entering a world of rapidly evolving, pre uh, rapidly evolving technologies, pre and prenatal diagnosis and therapy. Um, many of you know uh, that, that, the, that the conversations that we're having around prenatal diagnosis, uh, for example, around Down syndrome, are very different uh, now than they were even five uh, years ago or, or, or 10 years ago. And certainly the, um, the conversations around uh, 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 prenatal uh, uh, surgery and therapeutic options are changing, uh, in particular for this particular entity, uh, spina bifida, now no longer, you know, it used to be a relatively binary decision of whether to continue the surgery and have the, continue the pregnancy and have surgery postnatally or discontinue the surgery. Some people would throw, you know, put in adoption as a potential option also. But now in, in many centers, um, the, the possibility for prenatal surgery is, is on the table. And, you know, hang on to your hats because as Diana Bianchi, who is now the director of the National Institutes for Child Health and Human Development has uh, suggests here, we are just in the early phases of what we're going to potentially be seeing in terms of the therapeutic and diagnostic uh, options for, for pre prenatal and for the fetus. All right, so she's entering in this rapidly evolving, uh, technologically evolving world, and she's entering into a world of, it's a very morally controversial terrain. And as this group knows in, in such terrain, in particular reproductive uh, decision making, there are variable uh, provider uh, self-perceived obligations to disclose information or make certain referrals or to counsel directly or non-directly. We know, and uh, again, the group here has taught us a lot about this, is that the counseling and the concern is that outcomes ultimately will reflect not just the facts, but our interpretation of the facts as filtered through our values. And of course, there are important provider variables for how these facts uh, are interpreted, including age, gender, religion, political ideology, and one of the questions that our group has asked is, to what degree does professional orientation, the difference between, say, the perspectives of a pediatrics-based specialist or an obstetrics-based specialist, to what degree does that, should that be included amongst these uh, important variables? Now, some of you may be familiar with uh, the, the argument or the discussions around uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which is a very interesting, um, uh, very interesting example of how values and facts interplay. Uh, for example, in hypoplastic left heart syndrome, as 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 technology has improved, should palliative care be considered an option that is offered to patients in that setting? And in similar, similarly, we are seeing kind of analogous uh, discussions in which the interplay of values and facts is, is important with spina bifida, myelomeningocele repair. So here is uh, the, um, the, the, some of the data. Um, in 2011, a uh, randomized controlled trial concluded, about, it was a three-center trial um, of uh, prenatal open intrauterine uh, myelomeningocele myelomeningocele repair versus postnatal, um, and basically found that uh, there was a half the half uh, the rate of the uh, shunt requirement, um, and twice the rate of being able to walk independently at 30 months. So some important benefits uh, from the surgery. Not all babies are are are, um, are are helped by the surgery, but but many are. Of course, this comes with uh, significant maternal morbidities, uh, chorioamniotic separation, and this just actually came out online recently, uh, the, the, the more recent data. Uh, you know, not in significant rates of chorioamniotic separation, pulmonary edema, oligohydramnios, placenta abruption, spontaneous membrane ruptures, maternal transfusions, uh, premature uh, deliveries, uh, respiratory distress syndrome, um, there is about a 3% perinatal death rate, which in the original data was not different from prenatal to postnatal, but in CHOPS post moms uh, data has shown about a 6% uh, perinatal rate. So as, as we get past the trial, there, things may change um, over time with, in terms of the outcomes. Uh, 
The, the surgery uh, is associated with a significant uh, rate of uh, either very uh, th significant thinning or even dehiscence at the hysterotomy site. The surgery itself, to my understanding, involves a uh, abdominal laparotomy, a low abdominal laparotomy, with then a exposure of the uterus and a uterine incision, either a fundal or posterior uterine um, incision. The fetus is exposed, the defect is repaired, and then uh, with all things are, are op uh, occur as, as is hoped for, delivery is by uh, uh, repeat surgery at 37 weeks in which they go through the same laparotomy, but they don't go through the same in in incision in the uterus. They go through a low uh, incision in the uterus. So that's two incisions in the uterus, two surgeries for each of these cases. Um, so how are people, t and then all patients require cesarean deliveries for any future pregnancy. So how do we talk about this? Well, we have this set of facts. What about the values behind them? Well, this is how the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, at least in 2014, was describing this on their website, saying this is not a cure, but this trial demonstrates scientifically that we can now offer fetal surgery as a standard of care for spina bifida. And the Europeans, uh, this is the European group that does a lot of these surgeries. The conclusion derived from all data existing today is that maternal fetal surgery, although not a cure and not free of risk, represents a novel standard of care for select mothers and their fetuses suffering from one of the most ruinous non-lethal congenital conditions. So these are the, some of the folks involved with the surgery. Um, this was a, a Cochrane review, um, so, uh, which basically said there is insufficient evidence to recommend drawing firm conclusions on the benefits of harms of prenatal care, prenatal care as an intervention for fetuses with spina bifida. So a different take, potentially a more objective take, um, but there was only one study, and they reviewed that study, and this is what they uh, 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 determined. So now, this is a, 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 a pediatric neurosurgeon from England who uh, I, I believe has passed away. they writing in 2000, so well before this surgery, these surgical outcomes, uh, well before the trial even commenced. And she wrote that uh, this intrauterine surgery ought not be a stand, considered a standard of care until uh, it's risk-free both for the fetus and the mother, and that the improvement in order for it to be considered a standard of care ought to be dramatic. VP shunts unnecessary, brain development normalized, a normal bowel and bladder function, normal sexual function in men, and walking without or only with minimal bleeding, and that's kind of a far distance from where the outcomes currently are. Um, and this is a group of parents of children with myeloma meningocele who were asked, again, pre-MOMS trial study, the management of myeloma meningocele trial, um, some, several years before it, what outcomes would be necessary for them to make a recommendation of intrauterine surgery, say, to their friends, and they would said the VP shunt of 12% rather than the 40%, uh, wheelchair use rate of 8%, incontinence rate of 5%. So here we are seeing a, a very interesting example of where uh, we have a set of facts and we have a set of values around those facts and different interpretations of what should be considered, say, a standard of care. Not unlike, um, uh, should palliative care be a standard of care, say, for hypoplastic left heart syndrome? And it's interesting, uh, by the way, that more recently, I, before giving this talk, I checked the CHOP website again, and they've changed their language um, somewhat. They say, fetal surgery for spina bifida is not a cure, but studies show that prenatal care can offer significantly better results than traditional postnatal repair. So perhaps not casting it as standard of care any longer. And there is uh, some acknowledge, there is acknowledgement in the most recent paper on the mom's outcomes that we still have, uh, we have new centers coming on board and we don't know what the, those results are going to be. Um, selection criteria are variable around the country and we don't know what's going to happen as selection criteria change or are different at different uh, centers. So considerable variability potentially uh, in outcome. And, Hypoplastic left heart syndrome, as we decided, as we discussed, is an interesting example of the interplay of facts and values. And it's also hypoplastic left heart syndrome gives us, uh, has been uh, d studied, and it gives a very interesting uh, picture into the practice variation that occurs in prenatal, uh, in congenital, congenital 
uh, conditions around uh, the, the counseling. And so this is a study of uh, about 750 pediatric cardiologists and surgeons who self-reported that they, about 36%, discussed all the potential options with patients when the condition is diagnosed prenatally. So the options including pregnancy termination, uh, continuation of the pregnancy with palliative care, and then stage palliative surgery and heart transplants. 62% of them recommended palliative surgery or cardiac transplantation. Interestingly, if they themselves were faced with the prenatal diagnosis personally, and, and, and um, uh, if, if it was a pregnancy that affected them directly, or, or their partners, 24% would choose palliative care or palliative surgery, only 0.6% cardiac transplantation, and almost 50% pregnancy termination or palliative care. So what are some of the factors here explaining some of the difference that we're seeing in what is recommended and what uh, people would do for themselves? Well, certainly patient factors can be an uh, important component of this. There may be patients who are, who are presenting to these centers who don't want to hear about elective termination, they don't want to hear about palliative care, they want to hear about what can be done for their baby. Or the physicians may perceive, whether they know or not, that this is why the patients are coming to them, but it may also be that there are important provider and institutional interests that are somehow driving the recommendations in a way uh, that is, uh, it, that leads recommendations to be made in, in a way that's different from what people would choose personally. Interestingly, um, a study by Alex Kahn and, and the author of this original, uh, and of this study, um, uh, showed that looking at physicians' personal preferences about what they would do over the time period 1999 to 2007, they did one, an early study and a late study, they found that there was little change in physicians' personal preferences, even though the outcomes for hypoplastic left heart syndrome improved over this time period, physicians' personal preferences about what they would do for themselves did not change, suggesting somewhat of a disassociation between the objective outcomes and value, value, provider values around the set of facts and the outcomes. All right, now, so we have a situation where Crystal is entering a, a, a landscape of um, morally controversial terrain, lots of potential provider attitude differences, um, and um, this is all now superimposed upon a significantly evolving landscape for fetal care, where uh, an increasing model of care is where the care is targeted and oriented toward uh, diagnosis specifically and therapies targeted specifically to the fetus. And this is the North American Fetal uh, Therapy Network in 2010, and this is the uh, same map in 2014, and one can see that this is a rather significant shift. In fact, the shift has been so dramatic that uh, Detroit, which was previously south of Boston and Providence, is now north of Boston and Providence. So this is a very dramatic shift. But, but one can see, that one can imagine that of all these centers, that there's, a, there's a, probably a significant degree of heterogeneity in the practice models. Some work has been done, we have done some work, and Doug Dikema's group has done some work about um, demonstrating very uh, differences in available technologies, services provided, um, and one can imagine that the, the, management mo the management strategies may be different, uh, referral patterns may be different, uh, financial models may be different, so lots of heterogeneity in the practices, and this is not uh, dissimilar to say the heterogeneity in practice that we see uh, in, in perinatal care around the, the, the treatment and management of, of, of periviable newborns, where, we, where we've seen uh, significant differences in providers' uh, attitudes about both clinical and ethical matters, what gestational age is appropriate to commence with or initiate uh, uh, a treatment, what uh, gestational age is something clearly beneficial or clearly, uh, clearly not beneficial or, or futile, um, and we've seen in perinatal care significant uh, differences in, in management strategies among centers, um, in available technologies among centers, and the concern has been raised 
um, by people like uh, John Lantos and Bill Meadow that uh, the, the, there's, there, there's have been demonstrated to be significant outcome differences uh, amongst all of these centers. And um, the question is to what degree are these um, institutional and provider factors uh, influencing patients' uh, decisions and outcomes in a way that may be undue, in a way that the patients and even the providers may not be aware. And so the concern is, is that the analogy is close enough um, that this, this, there's a compelling reason to suggest that this may be happening in, in, in the fetal care landscape. And of course, one of the more interesting um, uh, changes over time has been the shift of more and more pediatric specialists involved in the uh, diagnosis, counseling, and management of prenatally diagnosed uh, uh, fetal conditions. And um, this has happened over time, and one of the more interesting uh, uh, um, uh, events or developments is that you now have freestanding uh, children's hospitals which are involved in this uh, enterprise and um, it's interesting to see how heterogeneous these models are so uh, you know this was a this was re previously the domain of obstetrics based maternal fetal medicine specialists and now we have it moving into pediatric centers and the uh, the centers are really very interesting in their differences so uh, children's hospital of philadelphia was the first freestanding pediatric center to house services for, you know, full services for prenatal diagnosis, counseling, uh, and treatment. Um, it is a freestanding hospital. It, it houses, it's a very uh, impressive unit uh, that where, you know, there's a lot of counseling and diagnosis done. There's also surgery done. It was one of the centers where the mom's trial was performed. They have uh, the, all the, the, the entire apparatus for the surgery as well as for the post-surgical uh, care of the pregnant woman and for the fetus are all housed within the pediatrics institution. Um, the next one to open up was Boston Children's Hospital Advanced Fetal Care Center in 2000. So CHOP is in the mid-90s they opened up their center. Uh, Boston is a very different model. Very few uh, intra intrauterine surgeries are, are, are performed at Children's Hospital of, uh, uh, in Boston Children's Hospital. Uh, they don't have deliveries within the hospital. There are some intracardiac intervention's percutaneous intracardiac interventions done at Boston Children's Hospital probably the, the the largest experience in the world uh, but those interventions are done elsewhere at the hospital uh, joining uh, the Brigham Women's Hospital which joins the the um, the children's hospital so the deliveries are done outside um, much of the counseling so so the, the it's really evolved into a counseling a, a significant center for counseling and and um, diagnosis uh, but not for treatment itself but still, a lot of the patients who are coming in ultimately will become children's hospitals patients once if and once they they are delivered. Um, the next uh, center to open up was Children's Hospital of Cincinnati, um, also uh, or the since the fetal care uh, center of uh, Cincinnati, uh, housed in. Uh, the Children's Hospital of Cincinnati, also a very impressive uh, facility, again, which houses all of the, uh, all of the, the, all of the, the apparatus for, say, uh, open intrauterine surgery uh, within its confines. Um, it's a different delivery model in that it is the fetal care uh, center of Cincinnati is a kind of is a joint venture of the Children's Hospital of Cincinnati as well as the Good Samaritan Hospital as w and the University of Cincinnati uh, Hospital. Um, so Good Samaritan is part of the Tri Health System is a is a is a is a faith based institution. Um, which uh, does not perform uh, elective terminations for congenital uh, fetal conditions. Um, so one wonders what, the, uh, what, what happens when you have a faith-based institution referring into a fetal care center that does uh, uh, surgeries for, uh, for the, some of these uh, uh, conditions or in which Regardless of whether you do the surgeries, the patients will still be funneled into their neonatal intensive care units and their surgical enterprise once the babies are born. It also turns out the University of Cincinnati does not perform elective terminations for congenital fetal conditions. So now you have two centers referring into the University of Cincinnati, referring into a fetal care center. Neither of those centers performs elective terminations. How does that affect decision making for the pregnant woman? We don't know. 
it's an open question. I think it's a legitimate and reasonable question to ask, um, but we don't have outcomes uh, to, to, to address it. Texas Children's Hospital uh, is, a, is, is, a, is another uh, freestanding uh, enterprise which houses a lot of the apparatus for these, uh, for, for these services. Uh, Texas Children's Hospital itself is a very interesting model. Um, a major pediatric center that now has spent a very l a large amount of money to purchase and control ultimately obstetric services and maternal fetal medicine uh, services. So um, it has the Texas Children's Hospital Women's Pavilion has a full service obstetrics and gynecology unit. Uh, they even have a unit for, they have a menopause center. So a menopause center centered within a pediatrics kind of institution, kind of a novel idea. Um, but you also have a, a series, an impressive network of maternal fetal medicine, Texas Children's Hospital maternal fetal medicine units, all referring into the, the hospital. And you have a, um, a, um, a health plan, the Texas Children's Hospital health plan, which um, is, I, I don't know how many people or how many families are covered by it, but it, it covers certain services, it doesn't cover other services. So one, uh, could, could imagine, you know, one wonders whether or not all these different models uh, affect decision making in some ways um, that the, so a patient like Crystal or others coming in may have um, difficult, difficulty um, you know, navigating. Um, but there is uh, this fundamental, um, uh, and now that we do have more uh, pediatric specialists, pediatric surgeons, cardiologists, neurosurgeons, neurodevelopmental specialists, neonatologists, um, orthopedic surgeons, um, et cetera, um, is there going to be a difference between the worldview? Is there a difference in the worldview of these pediatric specialists uh, compared to the obstetric specialists that could potentially affect counseling and ultimately outcomes? And, um, you know, there, there are a number of different ways in which pediatric specialists and obstetric specialists could differ. Um, they may have different conceptions of how conditions behave, um, the, about the risks and the perceived risks, perceived benefits, and perceived burdens of any potential uh, 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 procedures or surgeries or decisions uh, prenatally and postnatally. They may differ in who should provide counseling. A pediatric specialist may say, uh, you know, it, it may be hard for them to say, well, what, what, how can an obstetric specialist provide really full counseling about a condition like Down syndrome or spina bifida? You know, I'm a neurodevelopmental uh, pediatrician. I've, I've seen, I, I've worked with these families who at the course of their entire lives, I know what these families go through, I know what the condition entails along a great spectrum, um, and obstetricians just don't have that vantage point. The obstetricians, on the other hand, may say, I'm a very astute reader of the literature. I can interpret the data uh, a very, uh, you know, as, as well as anybody. And in fact, I may be more like the Cochrane review and, and provide perhaps a more objective review, um, and 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 um, and which you know may balance out in uh, in the end whether or not uh, you know who I should provide the counseling versus a referral, and then the, this, and and people may d differ on when the referral ought to be made. Should a, a referral ought be offered before any decisions are made, uh, when the diagnosis is made, but before any decisions, or only after any decisions are made? What information is is to be discussed? This is a uh, this is analogous question to uh, um, in the in the in the in, in perinatal medicine, where there is there are significant differences that exist among practitioners over what specific information should be discussed. Most practitioners will say, well, sure, yes, we, we ought to discuss the, uh, the respiratory distress syndrome, and we should discuss the, the, the probability or the, the possibility of intraventricular hemorrhage or what that means, but fewer may opt to discuss the retino retinopathy or prematurity or the you know, long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes, and even fewer may want to discuss or feel that it's important to discuss um, what are the financial or emotional burdens on a family of raising children uh, who are affected. Um, so similarly, uh, maternal fetal medicine specialists and, 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 and pediatric specialists may have similar differences in what information is, 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 should be part of the prenatal counseling process. But most importantly, and this is where my own, kind of, this is where I came into um, to this 
area of inquiry is because I um, worked as a imager both in a maternal fetal medicine center and also in a pediatric center that was doing a lot of diagnosis and counseling for pregnant women. Um, and um, you learn over time that the experiences, the lived experiences of pediatric specialists and of obstetric specialists are very different. Um, very different experiences with, this, with the spectrum of, of, of experiences during the reproductive years and before and after, very different experiences with, what, uh, with, ex uh, with, with disability, uh, with, with long-term uh, congenital conditions. And ultimately, um, I, I think it's reasonable to just suggest that these experiences uh, culminate or uh, result in lived values, differences in their lived values. And this is from Arthur Kleinman, who is a medical anthropologist at Harvard who wrote, uh, lived values, the actual practices and engagement of what really matters in a particular place and time amongst vexed patients and families and clinicians. And there's a significant difference just on its face of the lived experiences and lived values of uh, obstetric-based specialists and pediatric-based specialists. Over time, these lived experiences are processed emotionally and ultimately can lead to different values and emanate in, in values that, that, that diverge. Now, so what are some of the different, different ethical perspectives that um, that, that practitioners may differ on, and, and, and there, there's, there's the whole host of them. Um, pediatric space specialists and obstetric space specialists may differ on their perceived obligations of themselves to the woman or to the fetus or to the child that's to be born uh, or the future child. They may have different perceptions of obligations of that the pregnant woman has to the fetus or the future child. This can uh, be, be, be articulated in a question of how much risk should a pregnant woman assume for how much benefit uh, to the fetus or the future child? To what degree is the pregnant woman uh, obliged uh, or responsible for the well-being of the child? Is there a difference between being responsible for well-being and assuming risk? Um, if we're talking about crystal in particular, the question becomes if for whatever, if, 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 if the decision is made to continue the pregnancy, either because it emanates uh, from her truly held values and preferences or because it emanates from uh, this kind of all these other pressures and variables that may come to bear on her decision making or some combination, once the decision is made for her to continue the pregnancy, does that um, incur upon her or a, a obligation to consider the surgery strongly? There may be different perspectives on that. There may be very different perspectives on maternal autonomy. To what degree, what, how do we define maternal autonomy? Do we define it narrowly? Do we find it broadly? And uh, what burdens may we impose upon a pregnant woman's liberty interests um, as an extension of, of, of how we feel about their autonomy? And then there's a consideration, there might be different perspectives on the psychosocial and political vulnerabilities of pregnant women. Uh, many are quite aware of these very significant uh, pressures uh, that society places on pregnant women. There's very significant issues of class and gender and race um, uh, dis dis in inequalities that, uh, and, and other pressures that 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 are that that put significant uh, that can significantly constrict a woman's autonomy. And obstetric space specialists may be more sensitive to that from their experiences. On the other hand, those who are in uh, the world where they're caring for and advocating for patients with certain uh, disabilities and impairments may see the uh, enterprise, the prenatal diagno enterprise of prenatal diagnosis as, as being discriminatory toward, uh, towards those who are living with current conditions like Down syndrome. And so they may feel obligated in some way to try to, to, to advocate uh, for those um, individuals even in the form of uh, prenatal counseling. There may be differences in the ethical appropriateness of, uh, of certain management uh, 
uh, options. Some people may feel that elective termination simply is not an appropriate reason, uh, uh, is not an appropriate option. Others may say, given the current set of factors as I see them, prenatal surgery is just not an appropriate option. Um, the, the obstetrics based specialists and pediatrics based specialists may operate under different normative frameworks within their institutions. Pediatric specialists, will, uh, many of the institutions operate under the, using the best interests standards, so they may be, so the pediatric specialists may be inculcated with, in, the, in, the, in the kind of ethos of a culture where the best interest standard, standard is, is, is preeminent, so, or predominant, so that you know, with that standard, loving, well-informed, reasonable parents are given significant deference uh, in the decision making or, or to make decisions that they perceive to be in the best interest of their child, but up to a point uh, where providers may determine, uh, not lightly, but may determine that what the parents are, 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 are requesting or the decision they've been made is substantial, the, the harms are substantially disproportionate to any potential benefit, or it's simply unreasonable, or it's not in the best interest of the child, however you might define those. Others may be steeped in the culture of a principles-based culture. This is a lot of a uh, lot of the literature we've seen. We've seen the 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 the, the Turvin Act McCulloch model penetrate a lot of the literature, and there may be some of the services where there's where there's a lot of fetal surgery done uh, may work on this on um, where on the basis of this uh, principles-based approach to uh, obstetrical decision making. Others may take a more uh, a, a different, different tack, a tack espoused, say, by people like Annie Lyerly and Maggie Little, uh, Mary Mulwald, um, uh, Lisa Harris, um, in which, sees, which sees flaws in the principles-based approach, which sees, uh, a more, the, the, which sees the, a more appropriate approach to be a relational approach, or a quality-based approach, um, where, where we have to think of the relationship between the uh, m m rather than thinking of the, the conflicts and the interests where, where interests between the fetus and the, and the pregnant woman may diverge, we need to think more about where they're intertwined, interdependent, um, where they establish the, uh, an important intimacy. So people may be operating under these different frameworks. And then finally, there may be a, just a simple, a, a, not a simple, actually rather complex, dissonance or tension that occurs for various specialists when they're discussing certain uh, procedures or, 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 or uh, decisions. So someone who is really concertedly working uh, for the therapeutic benefit of a fetus, whether it's in the delivery room or whether it's intrauterine, may hacks experience significant cognitive dissonance, emotional dissonance, uh, uh, um, ethical tension uh, discussing elective termination. Uh, someone who has worked with uh, pregnant women, who has seen the vulnerabilities that they, that they, and the pressures that are placed on them, who has seen them uh, struggle with the various challenges of, of, of conception and pregnancy and, and all the various contingencies, just may see the fetal surgery, the prenatal surgery, uh, as, 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 as it just cannot, just it creates too much dissonance for them to discuss it in good faith. So, these are, this is kind of the theory behind it. Um, and so our group has done um, a, a number of different, uh, put out a number of different papers uh, in which we've approached the subject. The first way we approached the subject was to look at the policy differences, the, uh, the, the then existing policy differences of the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, their differences in their, uh, of their positions uh, on the ethics of maternal fetal interventions. And this paper came out in 2006 uh, with, uh, that I uh, wrote with uh, Bob Trug and Jeff Ecker and Judy Johnson. And so we compared the then existing policies. And this is, and, and we're, they were subtle differences. Um, and one of them was around judicial intervention for maternal refusal of recommended treatment. The American Academy of Pediatrics statement, which was, in 19, which was put out in 1999, said that if a physician feels strongly that further intervention is necessary, judicial authorization is absolutely required. However, given the potential adverse consequences of forced medical or surgical procedures, court intervention should be seen only as a last resort. So it's not something they take lightly. 
it's something they would do with a, with, with a, a feel a heavy burden and feel queasiness doing it. But nonetheless, they do leave room for overriding a maternal refusal of a recommended treatment. The then existing ACOG document said that court authorized intervention against the wishes of a pregnant woman is rarely, if ever, acceptable, even in the presence of court auth order authoring intervention, authorizing intervention, the use of physical force against a resistant, competent patient woman is not justified. So a, a difference, a subtle difference, but a real difference. And if you look at the documents themselves, there was a difference in how, how strongly they, 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 they held to, the, to, to, to maternal autonomy. And there was a difference in the risks that they thought pregnant women ought to assume. So the ACOG document did not talk about uh, a woman's responsibility to assume risk for a pregnant woman. They said the woman has some responsibility for the well-being of the, of the, of the, of the fetus, um, whereas the um, AAP document wasn't well-being, it was they have some responsibility to assume some degree of risk. So, Difference in that opinion. Uh, uh, and then there was also a difference in acknowledgement of the psychosocial vulnerabilities of pregnant women, which the AAP document at the time did not discuss at all, and which the ACOG document discussed at length. And so these differences ultimately played out to slightly different uh, policies. Um, ultimately, uh, the two groups came together in 2011 and uh, wrote a document uh, which was revised uh, and said even the strongest evidence of fetal benefit would not su be sufficient ethically to ever override a pregnant woman's decision to forego fetal treatment. Some very strong language in which both uh, groups came together. But originally there were differences um, potentially relating to worldviews and some of these ethical uh, perspectives that we discussed. Now, so how does a, our group want to know, well, how does this play out on the level of the individual practitioner? And in order to do this, we did a, um, a survey of uh, 100 of, and the res respondents, 192 maternal fetal medicine specialists, um, and 242 what we de defined as fetal care pediatric specialists, pediatric specialists who are involved with the counseling, diagnosis, and or treatment of uh, prenatally diagnosed uh, uh, fetal conditions, um, surgeons, cardiologists, neonatologists, radiologists, um, orthopedic surgeons, etc. Um, and um, so this was conducted in 2009, 2010. It was completed in 2010. And one of the things I wanted to point out is among these two samples, there were no differences for race, ethnicity, income, religious affiliation, political affiliation, religiosity, political ideology, ownership with a religious affiliation, their experiences, personal experiences with disability or, or uh, with themselves or the family. And, and um, I also want to point out that as we look at these differences, maternal fetal medicine specialists within and outside of fetal care specialists were um, uniform. Uh, as opposed to, to different in, the, in their attitudes. Okay, so with regard to judicial author authorization, we said, when it, do you agree? Do you agree when, if ever, is it appropriate to seek judicial authorization um, to compel a pregnant woman's adherence when she has refused the recommendation? Uh, we gave a few different examples: maternal refusal of AZT therapy to prevent perinatal HIV transmission to term. Maternal refusal of percutaneous transfusion for fetal anemia, secondary RHIC immunization at 25 weeks. These were examples that were cited in the AAP document. Um, and as it turns out, that um, uh, for both of these examples, the pediatric specialists were significantly more likely to agree that seeking judicial authorization was appropriate. Now, it's important to note that it's not, you know, it's not. Uh, that there are still maternal fetal medicine uh, specialists who agreed with this statement, but significant differences. Now, how might this play out in, 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 in current and contemporary times? Well, it, it's, it's, um, no one's going to be seeking judicial authorization to force a pregnant woman to undergo you know, fetal surgery, maternal fetal surgery, but it may mean that pediatric specialists have a higher degree of expectation for the recommendation that, that the woman will 
uh, will, will, will follow the recommendations that are made to them. There may be a greater degree of directiveness involved. We don't know. These are, these are still, some of these are still empirically open questions. We also asked specifically about the attitudes about congenital fetal conditions. And we asked about three conditions, Down syndrome, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and spina bifida. We asked them what was the importance of certain information. Um, in the setting of a, a couple, 26, we both 26 years old, married, coming and presenting for consultation around a fetus at 19 weeks diagnosed with one of these. What's the importance of information? That, what, uh, w when should the pediatric consultation be offered? What would their support in their role as a professional, to what degree would they support a decision uh, by the couple to terminate the, electively terminate the pregnancy, and then to estimate their outcomes, estimate their termination rates? And this is a crude measure of outcome. It's the only one we use. So clinical characteristics of the, of, the, of the condition, not really controversial. The majority of all uh, felt that uh, you know, it was important to convey um, the, the, um, the clinical characteristics of the condition. Um, this is the percent, per, the percent who ranked it as uh, uh, of importance. Pregnancy termination, there was a significant difference. The maternal fetal medicine specialists were significantly more likely to, to state that it was important for them to discuss elective termination. Um, again, the, the, it's, you know, it's not deeply polarized. There were, there were, in fact, a lot of fetal care pedi uh, pedi pediatric specialists who felt it was also important to convey information about that. Uh, some of the pediatric specialists who I've spoken to about these data uh, will say, look, I'm a pediatric specialist. It's not my job. My job is to talk about the heart condition. My job is not to talk about elective termination. On the other hand, if two floors away, you have an adolescent medicine clinic where part of the, of, the, of the counseling process for pregnancies for, say, adolescents involves talking about pregnancy termination, or the, the, the potential option for it or the services available for it, then to talk about it in the one setting of a woman who is pregnant with a, at 14 years old or 15 years old, but not at least discuss it or open it as an option in a woman who is a 26-year-old woman who's pregnant with a fetus that has a certain condition, there's, there, that may reflect some degree of bias within the institution. All right, personal contact. How important is it to offer personal contact with individuals or families with a condition? We see that uh, for Down syndrome, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and spina bifida, the pediatric specialists were more likely than the maternal fetal medicine specialists to feel that this was important. But I do want to uh, point out that uh, these groups are not monolithic by any means. And so what this, what, you know, how I interpret these data is not you know, so much about the difference between pediatrics and maternal fetal medicine specialists, but rather there's a lot of vari variability around this particular question. And you know, if a woman goes to one center, she may get the, the, the offered that contact. If she goes to another center, she may not get offered that contact. To what degree does that contact make a difference? And it may be just random where she winds up going in terms of whether or not she gets this Counseling, financial costs and treatment of subsequent and uh, financial costs and treatment of subsequent care, uh, care of a child. No significant differences between the groups for either for any of these conditions. But again, neither group is monolithic, and one can imagine that as as a, as, as Crystal or another patient go from one prior rider to another or one center to another, we're going to see a fair amount of variability superimposed upon the heterogeneity that we've already seen. Timing of pediatric specialists, basically uh, we asked prior to the de decision to continue or discontinue a pregnancy, we asked it for um, all of them, at what point should it be offered, um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia and spina bifida, similar, the majority, but there was a significant difference between pediatric specialists and fetal care pediatric specialists and the maternal, maternal fetal medicine specialists. You know, what does this mean? Why is this? Well, um, it may be that patients coming for um, uh, the patients w w where in which the fetus is diagnosed with Down syndrome may not go to the pediatric specialist's office. Uh, they may not want the referral, um, whereas these patients might want the referral. Um, but there may be some kind of difference that is perceived on the part of the specialists regarding how these should be managed or whether or not it's appropriate to have a pediatric specialist involved. Um, support for pregnancy termination in their role 
To what degree would you support the dec a decision that's made? Significant difference between the two, uh, two groups along for all the conditions. Again, the groups are not monolithic, um, suggesting that there's variability within the groups. And uh, so one of the big points here is that inter-provider, intra specialty differences may be as important as uh, intergroup. Um, patient outcomes, we only, we ask, well, what are, what, are your estimate, what are your estimated termination rates? There's only a significant difference after the multivariate analysis for Down syndrome, which, um, which the maternal fetal medicine specialist reported a two to three times greater termination rate. This may relate to um, patient uh, preferences and who was referred for what reason, but it could also represent some degree of bias for, uh, along the, uh, uh, the provider specialty distinction. Um, pediatric specialist, uh, you know, the question is, is it their understanding of this particular, um, is it their understanding of these particular conditions or is it more than that in terms of their, 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 their values around pregnancy determination? We found that um, for the presence of a fetal abnormality, effects of a child with disability on marital and family relationships, cost of health care for the future child. Along all of these lines, the maternal fetal medicine specialists were more significantly more likely to disagree that these were not appropriate reasons to terminate pregnancies. So there's more than just their perceptions of the conditions themselves. There is uh, a, a distinction in, uh, over between the two groups in terms of what is appropriate, what are appropriate reasons to continue or discontinue a, a, a pregnancy. All right, intrauterine treatment. Um, let's see, I'm about, uh, about 55 minutes into five more minutes. Okay, all right. Um, I'll just summarize the data. We asked about intrauterine treatment before the mom's uh, trial, and we found um, that um, there were that the, we asked them about to, to imagine a hypothetical procedure um, in which the clinical profile was very close to what the actual profile turned out to be uh, for prenatal surgery for a non-lethal condition. Um, and what I wanted to point out is we said, well, if the patient has a severe non-lethal disability, a, a severe non-lethal condition that will result in a severe disability, and the open intrauterine surgery will result in a moderate disability or a mild disability, would you recommend the surgery? And for both the outcome of moderate or mild, um, we, we separated, you know, definitely would recommend or would not recommend. We can see that for both of these, whether it's moderate or mild, there is no difference between the two groups, but a significant degree of difference Within, within, amongst the practitioners as a whole. Meaning that there's probably a lot of variable counseling potentially around this potential, uh, around this procedure or, or hypothetical procedure um, that, you know, if Crystal goes to uh, one physician or another, it may make a significant difference in whether or not they're given a recommendation about the surgery. All right, so, um, what kind of new world is Crystal entering? It's a complex world. Um, there are numerous portals to practice, to bias and practice variation. It's in very morally controversial ter terrain. A lot of unresolved clinical and ethical questions. Very heterogeneous practice models. Um, and, and then we have counseling providers with disparate worldviews. And I think where our data fit in is that, you know, just uh, professional orientation may be an important variable just as age, gender, religiosity, et cetera. And I think so going forward for those doing this sort of work, it's important to keep in mind and it's important to keep in mind for policy differences. And the concern is as with, say, counseling around the threshold of viability, that the locus of care may significantly influence the information options, recommendations, or directiveness, uh, which is, uh, which is um, used in the, in the counseling. And then, of course, there's, uh, I think, compelling reason to be concerned that the decisions that um, patients are making and the outcomes may not necessarily reflect their own preferences and values as much as all of these very, very significant provider interests and institutional factors. With that, I will say thank you very much. I would love to hear your take on the various policy considerations, and I will withhold mine for the moment. And I want to say how much I appreciate 
the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you very much. Dr. Brown's paper is open for comments or questions. Yes, please. Thank you, Dr. Brown. That was very enlightening. What's funny, last Friday, I have a patient exactly like the lady you presented. She's 20 weeks. She, she referred to me from somewhere in the north side. But she have the same story, meningomyelitis, and she had the same changes in the brain. And um, the question, and we did MRI on her and proved the same thing. And the difficulty was how to convince both the, the, the father and the husband and the wife. How, how do you approach that when they have divergent opinions on how to move? And I just sent that to the neurosurgeon, and I didn't hear from them since then. So, so the, the question is? The question, how do you, what do you do when the father wants something, and I mean the husband wants something, and the mother wants something? So they wanted different things. They wanted different things. They're not, they're not agreeing on the, your recommendation or perceived recommendation. Who wanted which? Can I? Well, the, the mother was reluctant to go through termination or interruption of pregnancy. And the father was just hedging to it. Well, I fell from 10 floors and I have spinal injury, but I'm now fine and, and this kid is gonna be fine. So he doesn't want the child to go through difficulties, but the mother is not really sold about that. And I was totally, I'm saying, look guys, I am, I'm, my job is to have mothers have babies so I could live them as an obstetrician. But it was very, very difficult on me. It was very, that weekend after that, I could not really sleep. Where, what, what is the real answer for a condition like this? I, I, There's a divergent. Well, well first, I, I think, here. well, two, two responses. Um, I think it would be hard to, I, I think you want to do your best to get them to work together, to come to a mutual solution in which the woman does not feel that she's been pressured into having an elective termination. I think that's probably, to me, that's, that's, that's a really, that's probably the, the worst outcome is where you have a woman who's feel that she's been pressured to have this termination. Um, and, but, um, you know, the, his, his interests, I think, are, are, are important, compelling here too. I think trying to get them to work together, trying to have them, you know, do they have, uh, do they have a chaplain or, that they can work with? Do they have a social worker they can work with? Do they have a psychologist they can work with? I don't know what the time pressure, obviously there's a lot of time pressure issues, but do they have people that they can work with who know them um, to, to try and come to some mutually uh, satisfactory? Can, I think, but I think that there are models for, uh, this is a rare case, but you have much more common models. For example, a, a, a couple who has three children in which there is an, uh, an unintended pregnancy and there's a tension between the two in terms of what to do with that pregnancy, there, there ought to be already um, intact mechanisms to help couples um, adjudicate that 
or, or come to some kind of mutually satisfactory decision around that. And I think th those mechanisms. Wait, yeah, wait, wait, yes, wait. Just tell Mahmoud to be quiet. Stop talking, Mahmoud. <laughs> Makes it easier. Uh, so here's a, a different question. It's on a different level. I like your talk. Thank you very much. Um, you talk a lot in a lot of different data about provider variability, both across fields and even within a field. Across? Fields, so yes. that OBs versus pediatricians, and then even within the field, within OBs and within pediatricians. Um, and so th it's a two-part question. One is, do you think that there's anything we can do about that? But the more interesting question to me is, do you want to do anything different about that? Is it to make a sort of extreme or inflammatory statement, which is hard to believe that I would do? Um, it's inevitable to have differences among providers, and that's what parents are going to perceive when they come to different caretakers or ex experience when they come to different caretakers. And maybe that's not such a bad thing. I don't disagree with that. I think that that's an important point. I don't want to advocate that the recommendations be standardized, that everybody makes the same recommendations. I think that that would be inappropriate. Um, and I don't want to suggest that the, all of the services should be, everybody should have the same service. I think that part of the solution ought to be that there should be standardized information, where regardless of the recommendations that are made, the information that's available is standardized um, and made available, not forced, not mandated, but made available. And within that standardized information, where there's variability within counseling, where there within information that not everybody thinks the same way about this, where the specific institution stands and why, and over time, some kind of enhanced process where there's some degree of transparent, tra transparency. But I, I, your point is well taken. I wouldn't want to say mm -hmm. this should be the recommendation for every patient and every provider should. But, but you know, you know that that the quality of information is just barely a starting point. That that you you could provide equal information, and yet the outcomes in in this situation or we talked earlier, prostate cancer, or choices about transplantation could, could vary enormously, even when all the information was in front of the patient who can't process or understand the complexities of the information. It's like when the patient comes in having Googled their three conditions, uh, which are very difficult to manage, even for an expert, and deciding that they know exactly how these three should be intertwined. The information alone is not sufficient. And I agree. And I think part of the enhanced consent process would optimally involve uh, independent, uh, that is, uh, uh, patient advocates or uh, those who can assist with decision making who are independent of the institution or the providers involved. I think if over time a cohort of uh, independent physician, uh, uh, excuse me, um, this, um, independent patient advocates could be cultivated uh, that are independent of the institutions. I think that would be an important part of the process. I agree. Dan? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that talk. I enjoyed it. Um, so I think uh, one, one aspect you didn't, didn't get into much is the whole notion of the sort of technological imperative that says that the mere availability of technology sort of encourages its use. And I think that's exemplified by um, people choosing to have the surgery um, more when it's a, when it's offered to them, but if you ask them separately, what would you know? What would you need to to do this surgery? They were much more rigorous that that they would want the results to be a lot better than they actually are, and I think that's a, a force that that really is important. So just the mere availability, and the question is, why does it become more, why does technology become more available? And I think one of the things you showed was the whole in 
it's showing the variability in, uh, of, of, of how it's being administered is that there, you know, there is an economic incentive here, right? These are cost centers that are developed. You hinted at it in Texas. They've developed this machine that creates these surgeries and, and they, need, they need to feed the machine. And so that is an important force that I think needs to be reckoned with when you're considering how people make choices. I agree. I agree. Talk about financial conflicts of interest. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that. And it's, yeah. Um, and yeah. I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, terrific. Um, thank well, uh, let, let, let me just. Please, so, go ahead. So I, and we were talking about this before. And so what we're talking about, I think, overall, is how secondary interests, secondary institutional and provider interests are holding sway over the primary interests of the patient and the best interests of the patient. And that is the definition of a conflict of interest. If you look at Dennis Thompson's 1993 New England Journal paper on conflicts of, of financial conflicts of interest, what he says is that non, that, you know, what, what, this is all under the umbrella of non-financial conflicts of interest, even though it's financial conflicts of interest. What he said was that these other non-financial non conflicts of interest are, they're no less powerful or important as what we would define as financial conflicts of interest, but we can't contend with them because they're not as fungible, they're not as objective, and we, we can't deal with them in the same way as financial uh, conflicts of interest which are more concrete, fungible, quantifiable. But I think in the 20 years that have, uh, that have come since that paper was put out, we have a fair, a compelling, sufficiently compelling data about how some of these <laughs> factors do influence decision making that perhaps over the time there ought to be more of a conflation of, of these factors such that these competing interests whether they emanate from ideological differences or heterogeneity differences in, in practice models, ought to be treated in similar fashion as conflicts of interest, where disclosure becomes more important for all these differences. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for that um, presentation. This is in no way a critique of your work. You can only study you know, s several things at a time. But your focus, of course, was on provider values. And I don't think I ever heard you use the term patient values. And I want to interrogate your use of the term counseling. So you use the word counseling a lot, but it was coupled with the word recommendation. So I'm, I work some with uh, counselors in abortion care, and I work with genetic counselors and others that, as a professional um, focus, have non-directive counseling as their you know, North Star. Obviously, physicians, most, most many, operate differently. And the end of their counseling sessions can be very directive. So it's a whole different counseling model of directive counseling where there's a very firm recommendation made. And I thought that an underlying presumption in your work was um, the counseling was a directive counseling. So right there, there's a big branch in a counseling type, which I don't disagree with necessarily in this circumstance. But I wonder what the role of the clinician is in eliciting patient values, and as we former McLean fel uh, fellows were so well taught, the idea of like then tailoring your counseling to that patient's value set rather than presenting this mental information, providing your recommendation without that eliciting. And, and I'm interested in that split between elective termination and then if we're gonna go forward with this pregnancy, there's still a whole host of decisions to be made. So, so I guess my question is, what's the role of patient values, and what's your, your thoughts about the directive versus non-directive counseling in these phenomenally morally fraught and um, technologically uncertain questions in pregnancy? Yeah. So I, um, first, I, uh, I mentioned um, the provi uh, patient values of, uh, uh, a few times, one in regard to the variability in uh, um, counseling around hypoplastic left heart syndrome, mm -hmm. and then around why there was a difference in the counseling uh, the, about Down syndrome, who mm -hmm. should go, you know, and also in the outcomes. I did mention that patient values may be, you know, who decides to go to those physicians. Um, my feeling about directive and non-directive counseling is that I, I, you know, the, the field has largely been committed, genetic counseling, for example, 
to value neutrality and non-directive counseling. Would you agree that that's true? Yeah, that's my impression. My concern is as we as providers hide behind our veil of neutrality, that the biases that we come to the table with mm -hmm. will emerge from behind that veil in ways that neither we nor the patients are aware mm -hmm. with regard to how we frame the decisions, um, the order in which we frame options. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's the, the degree of body language or how we express a you know, support for a certain decision. So I do have concerns that biases are emerging in ways that are not, um, uh, that, that are not, uh, that, are, we, we, that are powerful, but with, which we may not be aware of. And I would be an advocate for, over time, training practitioners to begin to discuss their values with patients in a way, I believe that it can be done in a way that is effective, that is a shared conversation, a, 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 a two-way conversation, um, and um, in which it could be done in a potential, in, in hopefully non-judgmental ways. I think it's just as we have spent enormous resources in training physicians to convey bad news, mm -hmm. potentially we could put resources into training people how to convey in a way that ultimately says, you know, Crystal, I, you know, I've looked at, like, you know, we've, we've done a lot of talking, and I've, you know, I've seen, you know, you told me about your life, and I gotta say, you know, it just doesn't make, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me that you would go forward with this pregnancy. Or, you know, Crystal, I know you have an enormous number of challenges in your life. This is, it's, it's just, you know, it seems unbearable, but I, I know you are a strong and resilient woman, and, you know, I, I have to tell you, it, I'm very uncomfortable with the decision to discontinue a pregnancy. That's my own personal value. Um, and, and I think you can do it, but I know that there are other physicians who feel di differently from me, and if you want to pursue that path, you know, it, as your physician who cares deeply about you, I will, you know, make that referral or, you know, or even if I feel, you know, it doesn't seem to me that I, that I, it seems like it doesn't make sense for you to continue the pregnancy, I will do what you need to get, you know, the, the resources um, for you to continue if that's what your desire is. Does that the kind of, is that? Well, it's interesting. Yes, I mean, that's a rich answer. Um, I think it, the, what people mean different things when they say counseling, that yeah. sounds to me like a true shared decision making where I get a role in this decision. I think a classic counseling model would say it doesn't matter exactly what my values are, I'll try to filter them or I'll share them with you, but it doesn't matter whether I think you should do X, Y, Z, though I might reflect back, it sounds like you don't want to continue this pregnancy and that's an okay thing to do. That would be a value affirmation yeah. of the person versus saying, I don't think it makes sense for you because who cares what I think? I don't have to live with the decision. Yeah. That's a, to me, that's a true counseling yeah. model versus a shared, I get a, mm -hmm. I get a say. Yeah. But it, it, those are complex issues. Yeah. They are, and you know, my, my main concern is to try to shift the balance of power yes. so that it is the values of the patient and the preferences of the mm -hmm. patient ultimately that are able to prevail in the ultimate decision and outcome. Terrific, thank you. Last question. Yes, we'll get you the mic. Um, earlier, Dr. Meadow had said it's good. He thinks sometimes for the different physicians on the team to have different recommendations for what the patient should do. And my question is, how is the fetal care center model different than the cancer center model, where all the specialists come to the table, they each express their own bias, they make a decision, and then present one unified front to the patient versus, you know, going to see the pediatric specialist, they say this, going to see the obstetric specialist, they say this, and then the patient sort of comes out with, you know, one institution saying two different things. I don't know how the different hospitals handle that. Some probably do have the model where everybody comes together at the same time, some don't. There may be some advantages to everybody coming together with a joint recommendation, mm -hmm. but then, 
the institutional interests potentially become very powerful in that setting, whereas there may be an advantage to having different institutions involved in the counseling where you might more, more likely hear different Different, different viewpoints. Now, hearing the different viewpoints, as you suggested, with say prostate cancer, um, you know that can be incredibly difficult. But at least you're hearing the different opinions. You know, there's different opinions out there. Um, you know, I mean, this, this is this is a common issue with 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 with, with ethics committees and with, with care in the hospital that there's you know five different views around a patient decision, around which you know the patient is never aware that they're. But I think it would be validating sometimes for patients to know that there are all these different opinions about what their, what, what, what decisions are being and recommendations are being made. Thank you very much, and Dr. Brown, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.